The Quiet Warrior Show, where we help top leaders find their pathway to incredible success and a lifetime of happiness. Here is your host, Tom Dutta, The Quiet Warrior. All right, everybody, welcome to The Quiet Warrior Show. I'm your host, Tom Dutta, and we're going to rock today with a fantastic interview. we got a lot of entertainment in here. Surprise, surprise. Listen, if you're watching us, we're live streaming across Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. Those are live feeds. Uh, you're peeking in the studio, seeing the interview. You want to hit the subscribe button down there and please subscribe to the YouTube channel. That'll allow us to have more people watch this show and promote the show and do more of these. Also, this will be produced into an international podcast and, excited to say, a YouTube premiere video. That will be released at some point in the very near future. Everyone, I want to tell you a little bit about the guest I have on today, and he is in the green room. And let me just start off by saying that he, it's not on the surface. He is not who he appears to be. <laughs> we, uh, I stumbled into a coffee shop a few weeks ago and sat down with Mr. Gordy Hogue. And Gordy and I had a, an interesting conversation, and we were just storytelling. And I remember when I bring people on the show, I always look for, you know, what, what's the why? What's the backstory? You know that the hero's journey narrative behind the show tells us that it's those stories that really are where we learn and, in, and are inspired. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mr. Gordy Hogue. Many of you locally here, I'm in British Columbia, would, would know him. He is a respected visionary leader and he's focused on making a positive difference as a change agent. He's done a lot of work locally, provincially, and internationally. He's been recognized for bringing people and resources together to positively influence changes in organizations within public and private sectors. He has been a, a member of the Legislative Assembly, a member of our Canadian Parliament, a mayor of the city of White Rock. I mean, this man has just an incredible bio, one of the things I ask myself is, you know, what's the staying power? Why do, why do people who are in public light, especially politicians, what, what gives them that sustainability, that staying power? It's because as we know, when you put yourself out in the public eye, everyone, you literally reveal all. And so let's bring on to the, the screen here, Mr. Gordy Ho. Gordy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. Delight to be here. Yeah, it's great, uh, great to have you here. You know, you're a man of many, many uh, colors and talents, and I, I just want to start off with a fun little video here that that uh, somebody sent me. So we're going to put that on screen. Now, everybody, just stand by because, as I said, Gordy has 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 been in the uh, in government, and uh, he has many, many skills. So let me show you what, what one of those skills looks like. Just stand by. We're going to roll roll a tape here. All right, here we go. All right, you see that there on the screen, Gordy? I can, yes. <laughs> Look, looks like me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, if you're watching this all, this is a, a clip. It goes back a ways, but uh, what you're about to see here, Gordy, why don't you just tell us? You're basically at work and you're getting ready to have some conversations, correct? Yeah, this is actually in the legislature in Victoria. And okay. it's, uh, and I have decided not to run again, and so this is part of my uh, my final address to, to the legislature and to the people of B.C., all right, so we're going to we're going to start this video clip. Here we go. All right, we're just queuing up for those who are listening on the the. Here we go. Have time to rest, mention the rest of the people I wanted to mention. I will quickly try and find some time to do that to the people if I can find where I wrote. Can you hum, I'll hum for you a little bit because I'm a really good, I've got a rap song that's on YouTube if you'd like to hear a couple bits of that. <laughs> you're so fly, rapping with your bling. You're so fly, rapping when you sing, my homies and my peeps. I'll be in the hood, my homies and my peeps, they're doing what they should. Find out what you got, give it up, take it home, wind it up. Gee, where did all those papers go? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to come back to reality now, Gordy. We're going to we're going to get rid of that off the screen. Just take us to. It's great to see yourself back. What do you feel when you see that? And and tell us what was going through your mind when you're doing that. Well, I was, as I say, I was, it was my last address to the legislature because I decided not to run again. And you're given an extra period of time to be able to uh, to speak to everyone. 
And so I had used that time and I'd come back a second day to, to pick up on it a little bit and I'd made some further notes, which I didn't seem to be able to find as quickly as I wanted to. <laughs> and so you can hear all the other members of the Legislative Assembly laughing in the background and picking on me as they as they often did. Well, it's brilliant. And uh, hey, everybody, there's not too many rapper videos out there for uh, for people <laughs> in government. So this one, I think, go watch it on YouTube. We'll put it in the show notes and give it a like. Maybe it'll go viral and Gordy might get a gig somewhere. <laughs> I call I, you dog. Hmm? I can't even clap in time, so <laughs> music, music doesn't work terribly well for me. I, uh, I've coined the, the name Dr. G, so that's what I call <laughs> Gordy, everybody. Uh, by the way, Gordy has a PhD, and I know we'll talk a bit about his passion for learning about the brain and science and different things. But Gordy, let's get into it. Take us back. I mean, when we were having that coffee, we started talking about uh, the farm and, and where you grew up. And why well, I want to sh- talk about this for a minute, I want to show you something. And for those who are on audio, you won't see this, but watch the video. Just hold on, Gordy. I basically just turned around and reached for this in my studio. This is basically the about the 10 pound ball of fat that sits inside our heads. This is a, a real medical replica of a brain. And one of the things I've been studying, and I'm working to to be accepted to, to do a, a PhD as well, uh, since my brain injury, Gordy, is really understanding the impact that early year for children and youth early year, what we call maltreatment, uh, there's research that shows that the part of the brain that handles stressors, uh, that it helps us react appropriately to stress in our lives, can be altered if there's maltreatment. Now, maltreatment can come in different forms. It can be uh, things like uh, violence you observing in your home or you know around you as you're growing. Uh, it can be physical, mental abuse personally. And they say that if there's somebody who's a nurturer in that same environment, maybe the brain has an opportunity to develop more healthy. However, like I observed in my career and through many people I've had on, business leaders, Gordy, uh, there's this, uh, mal- this part of the brain, unfortunately, when it doesn't develop uh, in a healthy way, it manifests later in life as adults and can trip us up. In other words, what I'm looking at is Gordy on the screen, but if Gordy and I are in a room and he's doing something that maybe triggers me, my brain is telling me that's that's danger. And therefore, I'm very interested in your early years because you've had a very successful career. Tell us about the farm and some of those stories. I guess uh, my uh, my parents both grew up on, on farms. My my father in, in uh, Saskatchewan and uh, he uh, they lost everything in the depression and dad was working on the farm next to it and somebody came along and said because of the depression they needed people to go to the university and uh, dad didn't have any money so they offered him uh, if he would work in the cafeteria that they would pay his tuition and he eventually got to to go to university eventually uh, went to university of western ontario and became a physician and uh, he was supported by a lot of people in the community uh, to do that and uh, felt very blessed to have had that opportunity and uh, he and my mother met uh, my mother was a nurse and they met in the in the air force and uh, they had both lived hard and difficult lives living up to that point again the depression was a difficult time in our in our country and they uh, they felt that they had to continue to give back. They felt so incredibly blessed to to live in this country and this community, and uh, and uh, so they did. They continued to give back and set an example for us. And I was with some people uh, just two days ago, and they were talking about how their parents were never there. Their parents just seemed to be away all the time. Well, our dad was away all the time as well, but we never saw that as a problem. We felt that was a gift. He was out in the community. He was. He would get up and go to the hospital before we ever got out of bed. He'd be home at six o'clock, and we'd be watching TV. And he, we get called for dinner at six. That was our time together. And uh, if we, he had a switch put in to turn off the power to where the TV was. If we didn't <laughs> come when we were first called, so we would come. And then Mom somehow had us convinced that if we were well behaved, we could go on house calls with him. And <laughs> we thought that was quite a reward. And uh, not many other people thought of that as a reward, but. Yeah, I just want to I just want to jump in there, everybody. Another teaching moment on this show. I mean, we we're learning hacks from Gordy. First of all, <laughs> rapping, and now with that little switch to turn off the TV. Today, t- today, I think we can we can program TVs to go off. Yeah. What I'm in, what I'm fascinated by Gordy is first of all another doctor in your life. Your father sounds like a, a great man, and it seems like you must have had somebody in your life around you. I'm assuming your mom who 
taught you that it's okay for dad to be away. As children, when our dads are away, that story you told is very relevant. It can become that woe is me story. Talk about your mom for a minute. She sounds like quite an amazing woman. Yeah, she is a, an incredible woman and uh, she sort of ran things, but never let us anybody know that she was running things. She told dad that they were gonna get out of the Air Force, that they were gonna go and, and move to this community. And and uh, so we did. And I remember coming home from U UBC one one weekend and I said to dad, well, dad, I, I need $20. And so he had me sit at the table and document what I needed it for. And he looked at it and said, you only need 1825. And as I was heading out the door to go back to university, my mom called me in because she said, never ask him for $20, ask him for $200. So about a month later, I said, dad, I need $200. He said, okay, and handed it to me. So <laughs> the little details and then the big picture, if it was something that he deemed to be important. And so mom, mom taught us all of these little tricks in terms of how to manage and work with, with dad, which was pretty unique and positive in terms of her understanding and her grasp for, yeah. for people. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I should you should, you know you should have told me that before I saw you for that coffee. I would ask for two hundred bucks. I, I didn't get anything other than well, actually, I got a lot of it. Meeting you and it was an honor and hearing you tell stories today. I uh, I started th riffing in my mind. What happens, Gordy, is when you say things, my mind's multi-dimensional. I just go in different places. I just want to tell you one of the stories that just popped in my head was about some of the things I read about the. Uh, the industrial revolution and you know back then back in that age there was no roads uh, uh and things like that and uh you know some of the farming families the mom and dad they worked hard on the farm and then at night the whole family sat around the dinner table so yeah. industrial revolution hits and for whatever reason the man has to go out to the job and that was the beginning of you know life uh guess what, the other the other story that my mom sort of I came home from school in grade 11 and she said, I just saw in the local paper that the short little league coaches, I think you should coach. And I said, gee, mom, I'm playing ball four nights a week. How could I coach? She said, oh, you could do it after school. So I got two friends, Larry and Derwin, and we started coaching. And five years later, our team won the right to go to Edmonton for the Western Canadian Championships. So the president of the league, Mr. Palmer said to me, you've got to go to a White Rock City Council meeting and tell them you're taking this group of kids to Edmonton and maybe they'll give you some pins or some money. So I went to the council meeting, came home after the council meeting. It was about 1030 at night and I was I was sitting at the kitchen table with a glass of milk and mom came in and said, how to go sunrise? Oh, mom, it was old people making silly decisions. We were last <laughs> on the agenda, which she reminded me I became one of those. So she said, you know, no, son, I'd always hoped I'd raise you to be the kind of person if you didn't like something, you wouldn't complain about it but you'd get involved and try and make a difference. And then she walked over and started washing dishes. And I thought this was in the summer and I had a lot of sleepless nights and thinking about it. And I said, I'll show you, I'll run for white rock council. And, <laughs> and I did that in, in the fall and got elected. I think they probably thought it was, I was my dad, not me, but that's how, uh, how my life in politics started. I had virtually no interest in it other than, what mom had said to me. And ironically on council was one of my first little league coaches, Vin Coyne was, was a yeah. bit of a mentor when I was there and I was in my mid twenties at that time. Well, that's amazing. So think about that, everybody, what Gordy just told us, it's another teaching moment. You know, Gordy, I, I've learned for, there's two different t sides of a story. One is where we're defined by our parents or people around us, you know, we're told you need to do this and others are, we're not defined by that, we're shaped by that. Yeah. And I find that very interesting. Dad's a farmer, he's traveling, he's not there. Mom's a nurturer and, you know, you seem to have this encouragement and, you know, you, you took a path, you saw you saw something in your story to be able to help people. There was, a, we, when we were having that coffee, there was a bit of a defining moment you were telling me about. I was talking about my childhood and some experiences with my dad, God bless him, he's passed a few years ago. I love him to death, just starting to realize how much I miss him. And, uh, there was a moment where there was a, 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 you were telling me about your dad and something had happened between you two. And there was this moment of humility. Tell, tell us that story. Well, that was uh, a friend of mine and I used to take the bus down to, to a, a theater, the park theater and go to a show. And we had done that on a Friday night. And after the show, we took the bus home, but we got out off the bus about two blocks early to go to a friend's place. And uh, the, our friend's older brother had bought a car, so we helped him wash it and sand it and, and I guess in some ways refurbish it. I lost total track of time and got home about 2.30 in the morning. 
and there weren't cell phones around in those days and so i walked into the house and got into the got into bed and my dad came down and started just yelling at me he'd never yelled at me like this before and he was said your mom and i are so worried about them yeah the, ne the next morning he came and sat on came and sat on my bed and actually started was very emotionally said i am so sorry i am so terribly sorry i yelled at you we were so just so worried about where you were and what had happened and and that had such a profound impact on me in terms of here I was the one that was wrong and he's the one that's apologizing. And that was uh, something I, I look back on on often in terms of how, how things evolved. So uh, lots of lots of interesting anecdotes and that. And I know that there are probably other, lots of other anecdotes in my life that I have not taken in such a positive, meaningful way. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that we all need to, to look at. And certainly as uh, Laverne and I were foster parents for a number of years, and uh and th that was almost serendipitous as well i was coaching minor football at uh, at yeah. a park here on a saturday morning at 10 o'clock a boy came across the tracks with a cardboard box and i said what are you doing and he said well i got kicked out of my foster home i'm just living on the beach and laverne and i've been married for i don't know six or eight months and so i said oh you can come and stay with us until this gets worked out so he came and the social worker came and decided that we had more room so we ended up with three foster foster kids so uh, who were all 14, 15 and stayed with us till they graduated. And I'm sure we learned a lot more from them than they ever learned from us, but it was a, a wonderful experience. And I think just staying open to, to those little things that happen in our lives that sometimes can, we can take them positively or we can take them negatively and, and a little bit of compassion and caring is, is something that I have certainly received and, and tried in many ways to be able to, uh, to give back in, in so many ways as well. And, yeah, it's, uh, thank you. Uh, one of one of the things we'll honor your dad. What was his first name? Al. He went by Al. Al, uh, and you know everybody as you watch Gordy talking, you go back and watch us again the video. You can see the change in your body language, your emotion, and uh, truly that's a soul moving moment. I want to just talk about that for a minute with you, Gordy, about something that I experienced. You know, growing up as a kid, it was a bit different for me. And my dad left home when I was twelve. Most people have read up on my story. And uh, it wasn't until later in life, you know, in 2018, where I had coffee with dad, and really I'd been estranged from him. Uh, he was a, a very violent man, and the, the family just uh, fell apart at age 12 and was kind of homeless. And I was thinking if I, I, I wish back then maybe I came across you and Laverne and he put up my hand and said, hey, you know, I, I'd like to be your foster kid. But taking people in like that, I mean, that's the part of this story. And we're, we jump into the, the, the career part in a moment that I think people, you know, po politicians, generally people don't always know that side of their story. You know, you, I assume, you know, you're put up in the public eye. Sometimes you're reading speeches and things. And uh, I'm just going to be bold here and say, Gordy, that, you know, the average person in the world lives on $2 a day. And guys like you and maybe even I, we're not relatable. And we, the way we become relatable is when we tell those stories. And the moment you told that story about your dad, you became very real, and I think it's a moment people will will really come to uh, come to their own uh, feeling when they see this. Uh, so my dad, I remember, I I got uh, the only time I got drunk when I was a kid was on my grad night. Now you have to picture this this scene. It's it's, it's I've never told it publicly, but you know, love you and your story. You're getting out of me. So I we had this uh, I had the Chevy Chevette, and I remember, you know, I wanted a new car. This was back in the 80s and interest rates are 21 percent and dear old dad this is when he was around when and he's drunk all the time he, he said sure son he says i'll take you down to the delta credit union and we'll get you we'll get you that car so we walk into the credit union and my dad had arranged a loan for 6500 dollars, and he sat me down and he said to the loan officer son sign that <laughs> and he <laughs> pays 21 percent interest and i i paid it off gordy i worked at the revenue canada at night after high school and stuff like that but you know that was my dad. It's like never, never expect a handout. I come home the night of my grad night. I was just so drunk. Me and my best friend Cliff, long-haired uh, Cliffy, I called him, and I, I didn't even remember. The next morning, when I woke up, my dad found me in my bed, and I had a water bed, which was on the bottom floor of our home in Sunshine Hills, where we lived. There was blood all over the bed, Gordy, and. And then when you go up to the car parked in the driveway, the door is open and it's running. The, the engine's running. <laughs> so we piece it back together. And what had happened is 
I guess I found my way back downstairs. I still remember it like yesterday, and I had a velour purple top on, and I couldn't get into the house. I lost my key because it was in the car. So I took a round Hoover vacuum cleaner, one of those big round ones. I threw it through the window, broke it. And as I was, as I was getting in, I, I went like this, and I still have the scars here on my hand. And I literally grabbed the window and fell in my bed. There was glass all over, and I collapsed. And, I, you know, there's blood. So my dad came down, and it's one of those moments for me, being a, an alcoholic and as bad a dude as he became uh, through his own addiction. He just sat there, and he looked at me, and he said, son, he said, I don't even have to tell you or say anything to you about this. He said, I know that you're going to learn from it. And, uh, cool. and I remember now he said, I, I, I love you. And that was it. Yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't see that moment, Gordy, until you told me that story actually in this about your dad in the coffee shop that I had forgotten about that one piece of the story, which is son, I love you. Cool. And so I think that's a great moment, everybody. When sometimes parents make mistakes, we yell, we do things that are wrong, but always say the piece, I love you that connects to to the person yeah. so thank you thank you gordy for that for that um i want to talk to you about so now you're in the 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 the, the politics what happened there how did you move through that because you're 20 years old i was bit yes in my mid-20s so i guess uh, i was uh, on council for for 20 years and 10 of those as mayor and then uh I was also working as a, I was a youth probation officer and uh, involved in a number of uh, something called the Unified Family Court, where we dealt with custody and access of children and uh, separation and divorces of families. And so yeah. we, we worked hard at trying to mediate, uh, arbitrate uh, relationships that had broken down dramatically. And, and I should say in there that I have uh, two sisters and a brother who have been enormous supports. Hopefully we've been enormous supports for each other growing up as well. And yeah. And, uh, recognizing that uh, they're they're always there for us, uh, for each other, and that that was an important part of, of the whole political process as well. And then at the I had done my master's degree at the, by that point, and uh, and then I was approached by Gordon Campbell. There was a a by election happening, and asked whether or not I would consider running for the legislative assembly. So we had a family meeting, and I decided that I would do that. Uh, I had chaired the mayor's council for Metro Vancouver prior to that, so I had a lot of connections throughout uh, the municipalities, and uh, and we were trying to develop a, a cohesive, coordinated approach to Metro Vancouver with 23 different municipalities. How could we how could we actually blend and work together so that Metro Vancouver could be the best it possibly could? And we went through a process we called creating our future and how are we going to do that and it was a wonderful process to to go through and do that so i took that the information from that and i did run and i was again a, an mla for 20 years with a number of different uh, cabinet posts and you saw my little speech at the, the end my little <laughs> rapping as i was as i was moving on and by that point i had i'd gone back and and to simon fraser and and taken my phd because i was interested in what, why don't we seem to learn from uh, information or evidence or research? What is it about de decision making? What is it about who we are? And we all see the world as you've described it. We all see it differently. We, yeah. we focus on those things that are important to us. So I, I needed to have that context from a theoretical perspective in terms of the things we're doing with. And one of my, my favorite quotes growing out of all that, and uh, it's, it's, Take, it's an Einstein quote, but I've adapted it. So basically, yeah. it is. It says that uh, we are in our intuitive, emotional self is a sacred gift, and our rational, cognitive self is a dutiful servant. And we seem to have created a society in which we have forgotten about our sacred gift and are living with our dutiful servant. And for me, that really does reflect it that so much of our decision making is done emotionally we have this belief system and daniel kahneman is the world's best known psychologist he won a Nobel yeah. prize for developing behavioral economics and he was being interviewed at that at a davos conference years ago and he said they said to him so how, how do we know what we know and we we have this assumption that we gather information and come to conclusions and he said that's not at all what happens he says we have We've got, we've got this way of being, this understanding as a result of growing up in our environment. And then we search for information to support what we already believe. It's not a linear process of gathering information and coming to conclusions. It is 
we have these conclusions and look at areas and ways to support them, which explains why we're, we've got a multicultural pluralistic world and there are a whole bunch of ways that yeah. are, are perfect ways to be in this world. Yeah, I, I just going to put that in the show notes, Daniel Kahneman. It's funny, we're all connected by threads in our stories. I actually, ha I just bought a book called Thinking Fast and Slow on, yeah. on Audible, and I think you'll recognize, you know, I'm going to learn more about what you just said. I didn't even know we talked about that. Yeah, yeah he's a, he's a, he's got another book out since then uh, that he's done with uh, with three with two other authors who are also distinguished people. But yeah. he, he certainly and he was asked at Davos, "What's the most important thing that we should can know that we might change the world?" And he said, "Oh, that's the focusing illusion." And he said, "The focusing illusion is nothing's as important as we think it is while we're thinking about it." And I think wow. that was a really interesting comment. Again, how how do we how do we find those things that are important to us and our values and our way of relating to others and to our world? And we we get overwhelmed by them sometimes and focus in on them and and become so focused that we lose the context, the relationships, and the things that are a part of them. Yeah, I think I'm loving the conversation with you, Gordy, especially in that area. Everybody, another teaching moment. You know, Gordy's got in and started or had a, a big, long career. He's still doing lots of board work and helping organizations. There might be more big things in the future. We don't know. But he's, he, he's teaching us things about how we think and uh, things that we don't normally hear from from others. The PhD fascinates me, Gordy. I know we'll, we'll probably have you back to talk about that. But I want to go back and look at this storyline. So there, you know, from the farm, you you took this path into politics. But I'm really fascinated by the 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 helping of children and by the 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 taking in foster kids. Uh, everybody, I can't show you the picture because I didn't steal it from Gordy. I wish I did. But you you showed me this picture of your beautiful house. And by the way, Laverne is your wife. And uh, for the American audience, I just we should mention when we talk about people like Gordon Campbell and legislature and all we're talking about the former british columbia premier you know gordy's very well respected in this circle the the you show me something about it basketball just tell us about that there was something you you did with your house i was blown away well we almost had our mortgage paid off and we had a big backyard so we <laughs> built a basketball court in an, our house so we and it's uh, in your house <laughs> in our house it's 40 by by 25 so there's a three-point line and uh, and laverne wanted to have a family room so we allowed that to happen but we also have a shuffleboard and three pinball machines and uh, a wurlitzer and uh, and all the neighborhood kids uh, come here quite regularly to shoot baskets and play pinball and and have a good time so it's been a and we have a well before pandemic we we have a, a block party every year at our house and wow. if it's raining we all while you all go into the gym we've had wedding receptions in the gym and it's uh, it's turned out to be a, a great meeting place and it well, Laverne thought it was a stupid idea at first. So she's come to embrace it and think it's it's okay. She she grounds me in so many ways. Uh, I love that. You first of all acknowledging and honor you with you recognizing your wife as somebody who's a strength in your life. Uh, I think men who have are public uh, sometimes we forget about that. But I don't know. I think would tell Laverne. I think Shaq would have something to say about that. I think I think I think he'd I think he'd love to compare your your court to his. So everybody will put in the show notes Gordy's personal address. No, <laughs> we won't do. But uh, so what? What I want to just throw something at you here about uh, purpose and passion. So you know, you, I've heard and I'd like to know what you think about that. That you know, after careers, there's sometimes there's a big letdown for people because a lot of times we define ourselves by our careers, but we don't develop anything that that's beyond that. And so the, here you are, and you've got this passion of. The youth and all these things you do to serve and uh, i just you know what 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 is it that drives you forward to continue to serve you know well and i think i think it's 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 value based and uh, certainly growing up in a family that uh, the mother and father and siblings who are brothers a social worker my sister's a nurse my other sister's a, a lawyer and so they, they've all been been giving yeah. in in some way or another and that and certainly dad gave all the time. And another thing mom, mom said to us as we were growing up, invite all your friends for dinner Saturday nights. We'll always have hamburgers and people can always come. And I remember probably five or six years after we I graduated from high school and I didn't realize this one friend of mine was on social assistance and his family. And he came for dinner almost every Saturday night. And he said how important it was. And it, of course, it never occurred to me. And I guess mom probably knew Far better about what was going on than I did. So th those types of things have a 
have a, an emotional connectedness yeah. with who we are and 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 how we understand things and and how grateful that we must be for those opportunities we've had and and there's uh i don't think i was terribly unique of that i just happen to have a, a lot of great opportunities and, and great support and uh, i remember another story with dad i i had i played basketball at university in the first year there and we went and we won a national championship in new brunswick and a friend of mine bill and i we didn't come back for final exams failed everything so <laughs> so so i and in those days they mailed out the marks so i was going to the mailbox and uh -oh. finally I, I sat down with the the marks and across from dad at the kitchen table and he's looking at them and he looked up and said well you know son i saved a couple dollars to help you go to university but if you'd rather me make a down payment on a backhoe i'm happy to do that <laughs> And I said, well, well, maybe I'll go back and try again, Dad. So <laughs> but, but there, there was no anger. There was nothing. It's just, you know, okay, if this isn't right for you. But so, again, putting the onus and the pre not pressure, but putting the onus and responsibility back on me for making those decisions and all of those things along the way, uh, I, I reflect upon quite yeah. regularly and wonder where they come from in terms of yeah, that understanding. You yeah, we again, we honor your dad. You had a great mentor. Many parents learn, learn, learn from Gordy here. I mean, letting him make the decision, not telling him what he should do. I think that's great. Yeah. So you care a lot about children and youth. And uh, I want to ask you a question about imposter syndrome. You get when you be you're, you're a young guy, you're in politics. I mean, let's face it, Gordy, you're very humble, but you know, becoming mayor and then uh, parliament and all these things. I got some cool pictures. I just want to put one on the screen here. Just hang on to take you back in the audience. Tell us what that is. Oh, that's uh, that's me signing in at the House of Commons in in Ottawa when I was elected. So that's uh, just the signature, <laughs> and and the, and the the blanket is the blanket I have right here. Oh and my it, goodness, I and didn't. It, uh, and it was it's given to me by uh, an sure, Aboriginal. Sure, hold it, hold it up again. It's uh, <laughs> it was given to me by Paul Assert, who started the Moosehide campaign. He's an Indigenous leader, and uh, the, the Moosehide campaign is to bring awareness to domestic violence, violence against women and children. And it's uh, as a result of along the Highway of Tears, he and his daughter were hunting on there. They shot a moose, and she burst into tears, said a, a woman might have been murdered here. Wow. And so they decided they had to do something. So I took them to the legislature in Victoria, and they, they started this, and then it's been in every legislature. And I also had them uh, introduce them to the prime minister. And yeah. it has now been in every legislature in Canada. And really? recent, recently, the RCMP have approved these to be worn on their uniforms. The first time they've allowed anything that's not traditional to the RCMP to be worn on their uniforms. And I think there were 450,000 people that wore these. And uh, on the day of, of uh, remembrance for the Moosehide campaign and, and the fasting day, 450,000 with about, about three weeks ago across Canada. That's fantastic. I just put that picture up again there, everybody. That that you know, they say a picture holds a thousand words, and we remember stories and memories. That that blanket there has significance. I didn't know that. I I just was riffing in my head, thinking when you started rapping, they just threw it over you in the legislature, saying just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it actually they, had more. They would have put it over my face if I was rapping. They wouldn't <laughs> want to hear anything. <laughs> uh, that's too funny. Uh, just for the sake of our international view, uh, listeners and viewers, what what the uh, Highway of Tears? Just very quickly, what what's that? Well, that, that is a, a highway that's up in northern British Columbia, and it goes from the center down down to the to uh, to the ocean front, and it's a about a hour and a half, two hour drive, and there were a lot of indigenous women in particular who were were going along there who were stopped and uh, and disappeared and so it's that's why yeah. it was named the highway of tears and now that's it's much better than it used to be and they've they've handled that very that's well wonderful. trying to yeah. move it yeah oh, i love that and that's part of the lay i hear think about legacy what are people doing with their stories and their work and everybody you see gordy's throughout his life has created a legacy even the basketball court and the kids i mean those kids will, <laughs> I, I think those kids will go into life gordy what do you think and they'll they'll be better off for it or at least they'll be telling stories about how this guy sort of took him in and helped him out right yeah we actually have a, a fellow who was our neighbor two houses up yeah. probably 15 or 20 years ago and he's now moved he's just he's married now and living a block down to the south of here but he, his kids come here all the time as well which is kind of <laughs> neat having that that ongoing that's cool connection and in, in yeah. terms of that 
And I just, I, I was, as I was reading your book, The Way of the Quiet Warrior and, and uh, reminiscing about Daniela Galli, and uh, I had been invited to speak at a Commonwealth conference in Nigeria. And uh, Daniel, had, I, I'd met Daniel a number of times. And so he invited me to go out to his village, the village of Anwari in, oh my. in Nigeria. So, and uh, my sister went with me. Laverne was not feeling well. So we went to, uh, I, I spoke at the, at the conference, the Commonwealth conference, and then went out to this village. Uh, we was about a two hour flight and then picked up by a car. And then, wow. then, and then we went to a house where Daniel's parents lived and our mother lived and they were having, uh, someone was there to, ask for his sister's hand in marriage, but the, the groom didn't get to ask. It was, the place was packed and somebody was the spokesperson. And then we went from there into this boat with guys with AK-47s up the up the river and uh, Goodness. To, to this little village. And it's the village that uh, Daniel through support has put a lot of, he put a school into it and, and has done wonderful things. And so he's been a, a wonderful influence and that uh, I've spent time with him and is actually his, family still lives in in surrey yeah and he goes back and forth so i i had uh, i've taken him to taken him to the legislature and introduced him there and he's uh, got a that's... wonderful positive approach and his story is just a marvelous story as well oh my goodness everybody just uh you know daniel agali i think i think uh, a lot of canadians know him they there's a they coin a phrase somewhere he's canada's other son or something like that yeah. but yeah, I remember when I when I learned about him. I just want to riff on what you said. It, it's amazing. You have a world view. Like I just now, I'm stuck on that image of going up the river with the uh, the gun support. And it took me back into when I was a kid and watching uh, Apocalypse Now at the old Stanley Theater in Vancouver. Yeah. Here, the, going up the Nung River. There, you've got uh, Martin Sheen and his little PT boat. Uh, uh, none of us would ever experience that type of story. And this is the thing about Gordy everybody i like is that he's he, he tells his stories many people have this wisdom they don't tell it but in a story you know we learn a lot uh i remember daniel said to me he said i, I said why did you go to the olympics and uh he said he, he said this he said when we were kids wrestling in the mud pits and it's nigeria right i just my yeah. brain sometimes yes. has a get blip and he said we used to look up at the sky and he said i didn't even know what that was but it was an airplane and they were told it's going to another land to the olympics and he said i don't know what the olympics are but i wanted to go and part of the thing that amazes me I, i'm sure you you know gordy but i have some friends became olympic athletes some american skaters as well and the amount of effort and work you have to put in for sometimes two three four years yeah. and there's no guarantee you'll even make the podium uh a galley came over everybody to canada and uh, won a gold medal and I still remember if you do, Gordy, do you remember like your blanket? There he was with that. Remember that Canadian flag? Yeah, what great story. And he put it on the ground and he, he kissed the flag. And, you know, here's a here's a hero from Nigeria who's now in Canada. And by the way, I think, wouldn't you say that's one of the great things about our country that we can bring, we don't color people. Basically, he's a Canadian and we can love him as much as anybody else. Yeah, and I think it's a wonderful story about him because he played at the Commonwealth Games before he went to the Olympics representing Nigeria. And the Commonwealth Games were in Victoria. And he tells the story of uh, he decided that he really liked Canada, so he thought he was going to stay. So he came out of the, their dormitory and he went up and saw a man standing on the street talking on his phone. And he stood beside him for a while. And the guy said, yes, can I help you? And Daniel said, well, uh, I, I want to live in Canada. Can I come and stay with you? And he said, well, I've got two children and a wife. And he said, well, you must have lots of room then because Daniel's experience was families of <laughs> many, many kids. That's right. And actually the fellow took him in for a while and, and helped him get going. Yeah. And, and and it's just a marvel story. And then he went to Simon Fraser University as well. And yeah, and it's just a, a delightful yeah, guy. A, and, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Great, great story. And especially I didn't know you went down there, but man, I'm living through that one. Going, going back to what I was asking about the, the career you know, they say there's this term, it's overused, I think, it's sometimes imposter syndrome, and it really means different things. But it's like, do you ever, did you ever pinch yourself and say, is this really happening? And, you know, what was your biggest fear and what was your biggest mistake? And how did you learn through that when you got into being mayor, et cetera? Oh, I've made lots and lots of mistakes and uh, hopefully have learned from, from most of them, if not all of them. And, uh, and sometimes I was... Uh, probably revealing things about some of the people I was working with that I probably should not have. And, uh, and, 
and felt badly about that. I felt it was moving a policy forward or something that, uh, yeah. but but using somebody's uh, context and in one case a name which was was inappropriate and I shouldn't have done that. Uh, so there's those types of things. Uh, when I was the warden of our largest youth detention center, there were uh, different times where I had to make decisions about whether people could go on passes and leave and uh, on leave and. Uh, I made some decisions there that probably were wrong, uh, but I'll, and hopefully again have I've been able to to learn from all of those. Although Laverne continues to remind me that I've still got an awful lot to learn, and I think we we all know that no matter where we are in life, we've always got more that we can learn, more that we can understand, and and more that we can do to to contribute to to the lives yeah. of, of of the people in in our communities. And uh, those experiences, I guess, when I was particularly when I was uh, the Minister of Children and Family Development in, in, in British Columbia, we, uh, I met with a, a number of parents of, of young children who had intellectual disabilities, and it was, uh, it was called Community Living, and it was with inside government. So I met for a year with a number of the, the parents and things that we created over the course of a year we created something which is now in place called Community Living BC. And Community Living BC, I said, I'm prepared to give you all my non-statutory authority and all the budget. And we put together a, a Community Living BC and, you, and our, our re, re, rules were, or the legislation said, you've got, you have to have two people with intellectual disabilities on the board and everybody else has to have a relationship of a child or, or a partner or somebody with intellectual yep. disabilities. And it was, going back and forth with with the government officials well how are you going to find 30 how are you going to find lawyers and we brought all the lawyers in and accountants for for the board and we won a, an international award from inclusion international saying this is a very forward thinking process by by which you, you this has been developed and it was these parents of of children primarily yeah. that were able to put that together and it's people with that lived experience that emotional lived experience that can make such a difference in the evolution and development of policy. And my other example around that was that with the indigenous people and uh, one of our foster child was is indigenous. And we had, uh, we had, I recognized when I was the minister that there's a disproportionate number of indigenous people, indigenous children in the care of the state. So I started meeting with Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, Grand Chief Ed John, uh, Harley DeJarley, head of the Métis, and Scott Clark with the United Native Nations. And I said, I'm prepared to delegate all my non-statutory authority to you, but let's find out how we can do this. We met for about seven months putting the processes together, and the deputy minister came to me and said, we're making great progress. Let's let's bring them down to Vancouver and see if we can sign a memorandum of understanding. So I said, well, just uh, let me think about that. So I phoned a good friend of mine, Grand Chief Bernard Charles, uh, who was a lawyer and happened to be Stephen Point, the lieutenant governor's law partner i said bernard this is what the deputy minister thinks what do you think and he said gord that's a stupid idea what we sh what we should do <laughs> we should do is bring them to our our property bring us to our reserve and let's yeah. have a feast so we did that we went there for a feast we had to wow. play some, something called indian poker which i'd never heard of but i had to provide three prizes so i gave three <laughs> three assistant deputy ministers that would be their slaves for two days. They all loved that. <laughs> we took a break for 15 minutes, sat around a picnic table, signed an MOU, and went back to playing po Indian poker. As I was leaving, walking to the parking lot, one of the senior staff from Victoria was walking with me, and he said, do you know what just happened? I said, it was, it was pretty neat. He said, if we had done this our way, we'd still be sitting in a hotel room in Vancouver two years from now. So again, wow. what what is it about the things that happen within the context of of decision making and one of my uh, one of the people i studied a bit when i did my doctorate is a guy named shieldini and he's a psychologist and he wrote a book called uh, influence which is the best-selling book on on sales in five different languages but he yep. said what you say or do before you make a decision or before you make an ask is more important than the ask and i've got i've seen so many examples of that through the course of my life and there's lots of stories about how, how do you develop that relationship the, the indigenous people know about decision making going back yeah. to how, how emotional and connected they are yeah. and how that changes the context of the decisions uh, that's uh, that's fascinating everybody another teaching moment learning from Gordy about how do you you can use hacks of the brain you can study and learn you know how how your uh, words and what you do before 
you ask people your hand out, how you can influence people. I, uh, I kind of stumbled in my career a bit and learned that by, by just chance, Gordy, a long time ago, not from a science point of view, which, which you've dug into, which I respect a lot. It's that uh, I always used to say to people, especially when I was in my executive career and I used to say to our sales team, you know, people, first of all, people buy you first, not what you're selling. So, okay. you, you know, it's about trust rapport. And number two is, you know, the pathway to changing somebody's behavior decision is to the heart or the emotion. Yeah. And yet there's so many what I call red type salespeople. These are logic based people who go in and there's just like facts, figures. It's a uh, complete it's kind of like to me it makes sense but it's something that i think i can see in your career you've used that to your benefit and all of us who live through the laws and policies that you've helped the, the province of bc and the country make you know we thank you for for that service a couple more questions for you one is about uh you know i, I really have an interest in people who have uh, what it call celebrity status careers and i'm not saying this for ego you don't have one but when you're in the public eye when somebody googles and they see things that put you up there as somebody who's well known and i i know there's this thing called dopamine that the brain creates in anticipation of reward everybody it's not created at the time of reward so you go out shopping and you buy the you buy that fancy thing that you take it home and two days later you, you're wondering where'd that feeling go well it's it's the journey of getting there so with all the stories and all the things, it's like adrenaline. I'm living through your life about your career, Gordy, and even the trips to the, the parliament. And I'm thinking about just how, how many things you were doing and successes and failures, up and downs. And now when you left public, uh, the public space, how, how do you, what did you replace that with? Or do you wake up in the morning saying, you know, I love myself, I feel fulfilled? Or when is enough enough? I mean, are, are you still looking for that to fulfill you or have you really found that space that most people don't which is to 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 go back you know to that same thing for that reason well i i guess i'm on about five non-profit boards now that that, that are really i feel i'm like making a contribution to one is food banks british columbia and we coordinate uh, about 106 mm -hmm. food banks around the province uh, another is an organization called brella which is a yeah. seniors come share society that, that we have three different facilities in Surrey. One that really has intrigued me that uh, is uh, called, it's a national organization called Disability Without Poverty. And mm. the CEO is a, a woman, a blind woman in, in Etobicoke. The chair of the board uh, lives in, in Kelowna. And uh, so I've been going back and forth and I didn't really know what they were about at first. So they, I said, well, send me your stuff. So they sent me about I don't know, 40 pages of different things. And I read through them all. And again, going back to the notion that people don't seem to listen to information, evidence, or research. So I took their their issues and I put it put it into one page. And this has been intriguing for me. So, uh, and basically there's something in psychology called transference. Yeah. If I were to say to you, Tom, boy, maybe if you wore a blue shirt, that would make a difference. At some level, I'm telling you that you're wrong. And that's what the approach they were taking and so many of us take as we approach government and other people so i rewrote all of this data that they had and information i said and basically and this is for, for them and they've taken it I, I said we are so proud to be canadians because we're signatories to the united nations statement on people with disabilities and we are so proud that Canada's Charter, Charter of Rights and Freedoms, <clears throat> I think it's paragraph three, we refer to people with disabilities. Yeah. And how can, how can we now assist you in being able to ameliorate the disparity that exists between our vision, our values, and what we're doing? And, and that's and so again, instead of getting that transference, we're, we're yeah. trying on the same side. So I was talking with the, the chair of the board, this is probably a month ago now and she said oh this transference stuff Gord, this has just changed my whole life and i said well, what do you mean it's changed my whole life and she said oh you should hear me talk to my husband now it's totally different <laughs> <laughs> so it's, that it's is really, a life changer <laughs> yeah so when you uh, ask them, so those type of things that uh, i still get some excitement about and the buzz about yeah. being able to do those things and want to be able to be and i've been approached by a couple of other boards and opportunities and so i'm actually an adjunct professor at simon fraser in criminology and uh, I've chosen not to teach because I don't want to teach virtually. I want to teach in person. Yeah. And I'm on a 
a, a terrorism, violence, and security institute that is uh, out of Simon Fraser, but has connections with Australia, United yeah. States, and so the gang activities intrigues me as well, and the issues growing out of that. So, yeah, I yeah, I, it's. Uh, I was going to say, do you sleep? It's, but again, everybody, when you look at Gordy's career, because many people are in in just uh, non political life, they finish up and they retire, and then afterwards, they they don't always create that legacy or something to continue to serve. I'm seeing through your hero's journey story because I, I developed that in my mind on the show that this, this thread just stays through there about helping children and youth violence, this whole thread, which is amazing. And I did find you on LinkedIn and saw adjunct professor, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that, again, uh, teaching is a part of uh, how Gordy's changing the world. Uh, Want to talk about self-care for a minute, Gordy. You know, you, Laverne must be an amazing woman, as we've talked about. I don't haven't met her. But uh, with all this going on throughout your career, how do you look after yourself? How do you make time for Gordy? What do you do to stay mentally healthy? And well, I, I try to try to eat properly, and I try to be active. And uh, and Laverne, actually, I should tell one story about Laverne. We had we had three foster kids, and we were and Laverne was not much older, well, maybe four or five years older than than them. And we would have a family meeting every Sunday night, and we would talk about what we we're going to do. And, of course, so she was the only woman, and this about, I don't know, a couple of months into this, she said, now each of you get a vote, don't you? We, the, the four of us said, yes, yes, we do. And she said, and I get a vote too. And she, we said, yes, you do. She said, from now on, I get five votes. You only get one, and I'm overruling. And so she faced <laughs> and it was, it was really, it was funny, but it was also a, a wonderful statement that she made in terms of that. But, and as you're describing this, what something else comes to mind. I remember when my dad was working incessantly i mean he was working night and day as as a family physician and he decided to retire in his 60s and we were oh so worried what the heck was he going to do and he never missed a beat he he joined he started delivering meals on wheels he drove uh, children to uh, portland to the shriners hospital that to do things there he was more actively involved in a rotary he just it he just there was no change but I remember me and my sisters and my brother, I wonder what dad's going to do now. He's always been so busy and we were sort of concerned, but we shouldn't have been. He just moved on and uh, was able to do that. And I think he set a good example for, for all of us in that fashion. Yeah, that's great. I, I think about values and belief systems and how important that is. You know, we keep our own, right, as we get older when we rationalize thinking. But a lot of times we look around at what's going on and, uh, you know, it's many gifts that came through that. What's ahead of the horizon for you? I know we, there's been talk, uh, you and I have talked about it, about you know politics again. You don't have to reveal any secrets or anything, but uh, where do you see yourself in the next few years? Well, I see myself. I mean, I've, I've been approached about politics. That's something that I'll explore a little further. Um, I, I, I really have enjoyed my work with Food Banks British Columbia and, uh, and uh, with Brella, and I've been able to make I think my uh, my experiences have been helped in terms of that. My connections in terms of uh, <coughs> governments, I've, we've been able to help get some grants. Food banks, British Columbia in particular, we were able to get a, a large grant from the provincial government that helped us buy fridges and freezers for some of the very small and remote food banks that had a lot of food wastage. Those things are are neat to see. And if the, if I can uh, continue to make a, a positive difference in in the, the desires of organizations, but mostly in people. How do how do we ensure that? And I, I think we're part particularly unique in in Surrey, British Columbia, where uh, we have. I, I think we we best exemplify the multicultural, pluralistic nature of Canada's constitution, of Canada's values, and uh, I think that we we we've got agricultural land. We've got agricultural land reserves. We are on the Pacific Ocean. We're on the U.S. border, and I think that we will soon be uh, one of the most important cities in, in Canada. And I'd yeah. like to help contribute to to, the, to that happening in, in meaningful ways. And whether well, that's just continuing to push those ideas and the values around those, and certainly uh, I've uh, I'm aware of the United Nations has has made a, a statement around uh, the cities and cities' role within. Uh, about 17 different value statements around environment. And I've been looking at those and, and uh, referring those to different uh, 
levels of government uh, to, to look at yeah. and to be involved yeah. in. And I think the, the big value picture, how do we start applying those those important national values to 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 our communities? And again, that uh, I think I made reference to you uh, about three or four years ago, I gave a TEDx talk and and my talk was basically that wherever we go in the world, doesn't matter where we go, most people care about exactly the same things. They care about family and they care about community and they care about getting ahead, whether it's emotionally or spiritually or economically. And 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 we should be celebrating that sameness that exists amongst us instead of talking about the differences. There's so many opportunities for us to connect. And there's a something called contact, contact theory. Or I'm wandering off on your Tom. Uh, contact no, no, theory. I love it. So that there's so often we identify people with the things they've done or the things they say, and we, we don't yeah. see them. And there's a wonderful book called uh, High High Conflict. And high conflict is when when you don't you're not able to separate the ideas and things from the person. Yeah. And so so there's a a a lawyer and just just north of uh, San Francisco, and he was approached by a couple friends of his who said we want a divorce and we want you to represent both of us. And he's a lawyer, and he said, well, that's not how it works. Well, he eventually did. And then he's 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 spoken to law societies across the United States about that, and, and it's become quite popular. And so this small community he lived in of about 100, 1,500 people was having all kinds of conflict. So they approached him and said, you, "You've got to be our mayor." So that in that you elect the council, the council picks the mayor. So he he decided he would do that because he's the expert in in mediation and arbitration. He said within one eighth of a second he was in high conflict. He said that wow. political environment is just so different. Yeah. And he said, and he did a terrible job in the first year. And then he stepped back, but stayed on council. And then he was able to get settled back. But there are lots of examples of what high conflict is. And, yeah. and but contact theory basically says, when you spend a bit of time with somebody, you find that they're a lot easier. And there's a wonderful story about uh, some Jewish families in New York who had conflict with some people in Michigan. And the, the, the arbitrators actually had the Michigan people go and stay with some yeah. of the people in yeah. New York. And they, they as a result of that, they said, it's amazing that they're actually really nice people. The one reference they made was, however, before they went back to Michigan, they went to Trump Tower and bought some Trump trivia. And we weren't sure we liked that. <laughs> but but basically, that that is, and, and there's the research around what's happened with big, big gangs in Chicago with major conflict and spending time together. So contact theory, getting to know people, getting yeah. to open up yeah. and, and share that is, is a, is a wonderful thing for us to to embrace. Yeah, I th I think, and you really te you really uh, walk the talk of what you're teaching there. Everybody, lots of teaching moments you just heard from Gordy. A few things came in my mind. Uh, one of you throw it out there. One is about uh, the conflict. Geez, Gordy, I mean, I I don't I I think I'm teaching. I have an education company, and I I do coach executives. I have programs I run. Uh, that was my background was was a CEO type. Uh, uh, transformer in companies and these uh you know i teach now turn i teach the one thing i teach now is no news no news like turn off the bloody tv yeah. and when you talk about conflict like american politics i have a lot of friends in america and i'm starting to take them off my social feeds because sure. you watch i kind of think this way i say okay if politicians are in the world to influence children and we know that whatever they hear and see influences the way they think the way they feel and possibly those people grow up to be leaders and influencers in society, then why do why do the American politicians, uh, you know, they're so ruthless, tearing each other down, and it's it's just ridiculous. I, I, I'd rather see Gordy doing his rap dance or talking. I mean, you're a kind, kind person. I know, you know, behind closed doors there's debates and things, but, you know, I just want to put it out there that it's, it really is a field. Somebody said to me a while ago when we were talking about politics that I sure wouldn't want to be involved in the United States. Yeah. And, and maybe that's just something we look at the way the world is so messed up. Uh, the last thing around that I was thinking when you said about uh, politics, like possibly maybe you're looking at some things. I, I saw a post about our premier uh, step, he's stepping down. Okay. I don't know all the reasons. I know he battled some health issues. Uh, he looks pretty thin too, but hope he's okay. And I was thinking, man, the decision to, to step in and take a role like that now, when you look at, I wrote down on a piece of paper yesterday, if I was stepping into that role, what would be all the issues that I would have to deal with? And now it's not just British Columbia, but it's this whole European possible third world war, uh, it's recession, the price of oil, it's all this supply chain. 
it's a huge uh it's a huge job to be involved in leadership yeah. and, and i'm just i'm just wondering if you if if you look at it that way how how i mean would you step into that arena i'm not suggesting anything about you here in terms of being a premier but is it too complex a world to to get into leadership now it is complex but it's ever more important that we have people that do that and just to, you made me think of what we had our food banks bc we had our three-day conference about two weeks ago yeah and i chaired a, a session with some of the very small food banks around the province and they said every one of them said something that basically the same thing they said during the pandemic we've had more contributions than we've ever had and sadly they said or particularly well one in particular but all of them agreed said social media is making it very difficult she wow. said in, in some examples they had people that were picketing outside of their food bank saying these people don't deserve to get food because there are every restaurant needs a somebody there are jobs for everyone so this this social media that uh, we've always had those people with those thoughts that existed in our community that, uh, but through social media now they connect within the community they connect within the province within the pro within the country and around the, the world. And yeah. when we when we saw those uh, four, the Muslim family of four just over a year ago was run down by a, a white racist in, in London, yes. Ontario, and, and growing out of that. So I've attended two sessions about that, in memory of that. And I was just looking up some research and apparently we are getting close in Canada to having something like over 250 white supremacist groups. Now that just- Wow. That, boggles me but it's the social media connections that apparently do that and in the united states i'm sure they have that's crazy that magnified hundreds of times but but when you no matter what your belief system is you can find things that will reinforce and support that so how do how do we ensure that, that the values of are are important in that that the that the values of, of humanity and caring and commitment to each other yeah we, we, we live in a social society but social media is is allowing people to attack them for yeah. for reasons that are inconsistent that are values that are not consistent with with what our majority of values are as as canadians and as members of the united nations and members of our world so how, how do we deal with that and I, and i think that as you're describing that there are some people that really i i don't want to be involved in that but but it's ever so important that yeah the people who care and are committed do stay involved in that and and do reference that and and, and reference it for the right reasons i watching some of the things happening in the united states where people say well i'm not supporting uh, that or i'm not supporting whatever it might be because it might hurt me get my re-election instead of yeah. having being grounded in the values that are important <laughs> and so, and it's and which being re-elected is not one of them yeah it reminds me of uh, and by the way i was going to say that earlier that uh, there's many politicians and there's lots of stories out there of politicians who fell from grace or maybe aren't loved or liked and everyone there's a bit of a, a fascination here i have because here's Gord, gordy I, you know it's hard to find dirt on you i'm sure there's mistakes you've made but i think generally you're a, a man of integrity a kind person a hell of a servant and you know people you're one of the most likable people in pu that's been in public life that is really hard to sustain over a, a lifetime and i don't expect you to to answer on that because you know you're humble but uh, whatever your secret sauce is, and I mean, package that, teach it to children and youth. And I think it comes through your learning about building relationships, all this stuff you've been teaching us today on the show. Uh, uh, I, they, I just think it's fabulous. want to uh, do a couple things as we wrap up here. I have a really big question before I give you a couple of acknowledgements. One is, you know, what, what, how do you like your hamburger cooked and what's on it? <laughs> well, when I, when I was going to UBC and didn't have much money, we lived on... A friend of mine, Brian Copkin, and I lived not far from a white spot. And so we would often walk up to the white spot and wait for people to leave, would leave their little bits of hamburger, on, and we would sit it down and, and finish the pieces for them. And a white spot hamburger with that secret sauce, that triple O yeah. sauce, that was, was, was and continues to be one of my favorites. Yeah, I, I actually, because I'm a home chef, so we talk about what connects people and their passions. If you fall, if people, everybody, if you go to the Quiet Warrior Eats, I have actually have a, a little shameless plug here, Gordy. I escaped what was going on in my home as a kid by cooking, and I be, this is a passion. I do a lot of things, but the uh, so I go and create food. But what I started doing was 
because I live by, you know, in the, in a village setting where I can go to my butcher and my fishmonger, everything's here. Yeah. And especially when I got my brain injury, I needed to keep healthy. I used, I come up like, for example, I'm talking to Gordy Hogg here. I will then go for a walk to the village and look at stuff. And my brain says that, 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 cause I'm creating a picture of something between Gordy and I, and then I'll go cook and create a plate. Anyway, if you go to the Quiet War Eats, you'll see all these yeah. plates I've created over the years. I'm getting people <laughs> messaging me saying, are you a chef? Sure. And so actually a little bit of fun here, maybe I'll cook for you one day, but yeah. I'm thinking of, I've got bought some gear to actually tape my first cooking show in my kitchen. But why I'm telling you that story is, is that that's something that creates passion for me. That's something like, you know, I feel no pain and a love. And I remember you said something really uh, helpful to us that we're all connected by these these single uh, threads. We have to find that. Uh, there's a uh, cooking show host who met the Dalai Lama and I watched the, the show and they were talking about food and there was this aha moment where Dalai Lama said, I think you're right. He said, the one thing in the world that everybody can connect to is, is food. It unites everybody. I go sit at an Indian restaurant, Chinese restaurant. I go in there, I'm not racist. I don't have issues. I love the food. So I uh, really enjoyed the, sharing that, those insights with you. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to honor you with something kind of fun here. So hold on, Gordy. I'm going to full screen me for a minute, so bear with me. So if you can see there on the uh, flat screen, that's an image. Uh, Gordy, I'll bring you back here. That's an image. I don't know if you've heard of Challenge Coins. I'm pretty yes, sure a guy like you probably have some. The Challenge Coins are started in World War One, and they were carried in the pocket of soldiers to commit community. And, you know, they had fun with it. If you didn't show up with yours, you bought dinner or drinks. And I know when my dad was in AA for 22 years, he had a coin. First responders have those. When I started the show, Gordy, I really just started it as, a, as an idea to bring people like you or from around the world and tell their stories so we can learn. I created this as the show award. So it's handcrafted and painted, minted in the U.S. The front of it is the image of the show. The back is actually the fully illustrated uh, hero's journey narrative, which is behind the show. So today, because you are such a, a man of less ego and more, uh, more uh, humility and uh, teaching, we're inducting you into the Quiet Warriors. There, we have these coins now in 17 uh, countries. About 40 a year will go out. They're very hard to get. And some of the, if you go to the archives of our show, some of the people that carry them are pretty amazing people like yourself. So congratulations. Welcome to the tribe. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that can uh, hopefully. So you, you and I will meet, so I can give it to you in person. This is when I don't have to. So we just put a little fireworks up there. <laughs> we're just cel celebrating Gordy here, everybody. Welcome to the Quiet Warrior Tribe. And last, I want to honor you with four words. These are leadership words, maybe five. I've just been writing them down as I talk to you. One is worldview. Uh, Gordy has a worldview, which really is a gift. Number two is love, Gordy. You. you you're humble, but there's something that comes out of you when you talk about people and uh, helping others. Three is Trailblazer. Uh, there was a movie called Moneyball, and they said the first one through the wall gets bloody. And I think in some of the many of the things you told us you've done in your life, you're not afraid to get bloody, man. And I think it's awesome. Four is humility. Uh, and five is connector. There's a, a book I, I read a long time ago by Malcolm Gladwell, and uh, he kind of characterized people, Gordy, and he said there's mavens and there's connectors. And if you find somebody who's both, it's like that person is the person you want to know. A uh, connector is somebody who can connect people, just like, you know, you, you meet somebody and you say, hey, I'll introduce you to Parliament or get a, you know, meet somebody. By the way, I like a tour of Parliament, Gordy, just put that on your short list. And uh, so Gordy's a connector, everybody, and uh, he gives. So the person you want to get to know and behind everybody are, are, are much more more people. So on, on that note, I'll give it to you to, to wrap us up. I mean, you can do a rap song or you can, maybe the, maybe the, maybe the question you can leave us on is if you look ahead in the world, when you're done with this world, what, uh, what do you want to, what do you want to leave as your legacy? You probably told us about a lot of that. Well, I guess as you were talking about being a chef and walking and, and cooking, one thing that uh, came to mind is, uh, well, well, firstly, when the Kentucky fried chicken opened in, in, South Surrey, White Rock. I was in high school. Two of my friends, we went up and stole the cardboard Colonel Saunders, took him <laughs> back to mom and dad's, put a blindfold on him and sent a note to them. If you ever want to see the Colonel again, leave three chicken dinners at the end of the counter at three o'clock today. So we drove back up there and there were the three chicken dinners. We served up the Colonel Saunders and about, I don't know how many years later that 
this is in the local paper that uh, yeah. that I I had kidnapped the colonel and it was, but you're talking about about walking and and experiencing things. There's uh, we talked about Daniel Kahneman earlier, and Daniel yeah. Kahneman, a lot of his research with his research partner was a guy named Amos Tversky, and they would go out and walk, and that's how they learned. They didn't sit in a laboratory doing things. They actually walked and talked in the environment. And I think there's such a good connection that yeah. happens with people and with the environment and the things that happen. So again, that's that blend of, of the thought process and the emotionality that exists in terming that. And to the quick anecdote about that, there one of the research that, that they didn't do, but they reference is that there were they took a hundred x-rays and gave it to 50 radiologists at the desk and they were and some anomalies in them. The people at their desk, the radiologists got about 85% of them right. They took the same ones and gave them to a hundred other radiologists who were on a treadmill. They got 99% right. Wow. So what happens when we're actually engaged and not just thought process, but actually have things going yeah. and, and doing so. Uh, I hope that I can continue to, uh, to learn, to be engaged, uh, to be passionate about things and, uh, until the, the time is for me to move on. And uh, so I will do everything I can to, to do and to contribute in a meaningful way. And we're gonna become grandparents on July 10th is, is yeah, our yeah. granddaughter is due. So that, <laughs> that's something we're excited about as well. Gordy, that's gonna change your life, man. I, I, see, I know a little bit about that through my wife's, uh, well, she, she has, uh, I have two stepsons are older, yeah. but I uh, got an eight year old. And uh, that's amazing. I think you'll make a great granddad. You got to teach her how to shoot hoops, okay? Okay. Got that. <laughs> Wind the hoop down so it's this high so she can dunk when she can walk. Exactly. And always <laughs> come down to her level when you're teaching her. That's pretty yeah, amazing. That's great. Yeah. Well, everybody, uh, find that true passion like you've heard from uh, Gordy there and turn it into a purpose to, to change people's lives and, you know, live that life that you deserve and desire. Gordy. I just can't say how much I love you and your story. Thanks for being here. I know I'll talk to you again. And uh, you've really been a treat to have on the show. Well, thank you very much for, for sharing. It's been a delight having you find all these parts of me that I'd forgotten about and pulling them out again and engaging. So thank you so much for what you do. You're welcome. Just uh, stand by there, Gordy. We're just going to wrap up here and then yeah. I'll come back to you. <laughs> www.kreat.ca All right, that's a wrap. How did it go, Gordy? I had a lot wow. of fun. We went a lot longer <laughs> than I thought we were going to go. I I'm just... telling you. I'm telling you, the, the storytelling is it. Uh, I had a lot of fun. So what, uh, what we're going to do, I'm just going to take us offline now. Uh, just stand by and then I'll let you go.